Welcome everyone to the Autism and COVID Vaccines webinar. Um, I'm Stuart Spillman. I'm gonna begin with some housekeeping notes. Uh, one, this webinar is being recorded, so you will be able to access it and share it from the Autism Speaks YouTube channel. Uh, that channel is available at www.youtube.com slash Autism Speaks. Um, second, a note about accessibility. Following the webinar, attendees will receive by email a plain language summary of our facts from today that will also be available on our website and the YouTube recording. YouTube also offers cap closed captioning options in English, Spanish, and other common languages to, for those who need that support. Uh, three, please submit your questions using the Q&A function in your Zoom window. We'll get to as many audience questions as we can during our one hour together. And be sure to follow our Facebook and Twitter accounts where we'll share a summary of today's talk and answer any questions in writing that we don't get to live today. And four, members of our autism response team are there to take person specific questions and connect you to information and resources. So with those housekeeping notes out of the way, I'm going to introduce our panelists. First, um, Dr. Georgina Peacock, Director, Division of Human, Human Development and Disability, National Center on Birth Defects and Developmental Disabilities, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome, Georgina. Next, Dr. Arun Kapur, Director, Data Science and Evaluation Research, Autism Speaks. Welcome, Arun. Chris Banks, President, Chief Executive Officer, Autism Society of America. Welcome, Chris. Allison Singer, co-founder and president, Autism Science Foundation. I'm Stuart Spillman. I'm senior vice president for advocacy at Autism Speaks. So welcome everyone. Uh, very glad uh, you could join us uh, for this webinar. Um, I'm going to um, uh, now hand off to Dr. Peacock um, and ask uh, Dr. Peacock um, about what we know about how COVID impacts the autism community. Dr. Peacock. Uh, thanks, Stuart. It's great to be here today. And um, as uh, Stuart just mentioned, I'd like to share with you a little bit of information about COVID-19 and um, what makes people maybe at higher risk for complications from COVID. And then I'm going to talk about um, some of the ways to counteract that, including the vaccine implementation. Next slide, please. Um, and so that summarizes this. And then at the end that I will um, share some resources. Next slide, thanks. So who is at risk uh, for uh, complications from COVID? We uh, are not, so not every person with a disability may be at higher risk for COVID-19 uh, illness. However, we know that there are many people with disabilities that are at higher risk for getting uh, COVID-19 or having severe illness. Um, some of those people with disabilities may be at higher risk because they have underlying conditions, uh, such as, uh, and, and we know that adults with disabilities are three times more likely than adults without disabilities to have things like heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and cancer. So those are things that we know put people at higher risk for disability. Some of the other things that we, uh, sorry, uh, higher risk for um, COVID-19, severe uh, impacts from COVID-19. We also know that there are other things that may put someone at a higher risk for complications from COVID. Those can be um, related to where people live. So they may live in a congregate setting or they may live in a household that has um, either a lot of people that live in that household or um, sort of multi-generational households. We know that people with disabilities um, often have uh, worse access to healthcare that can put you at higher risk for complications from COVID-19. Um, and there may be people with disabilities who work in settings where they interact a lot with the public. So what we call maybe frontline essential workers. And that again is something that would put you at higher risk for getting COVID because there's more risk for exposure. So those are different ways that we can think about um, that may put people with disabilities and people with autism at higher risk for complications from COVID. Next slide. 
So we also know that um, people with developmental and behavioral disorders, such as people with autism, may have difficulties accessing information, understanding or practicing some of those preventative measures like wearing a mask or social distancing and uh, communicating their symptoms of illness. So you'll see here on this slide that we describe some of those um, developmental and behavioral disorders that may uh, need greater attention when we're thinking about um, prevention uh, approaches to COVID-19. And all of this can be accessed on the CDC website um, if you'd like to look at that for more information. The next slide. So I spoke a little bit about congregate settings before, but I did want to alert you to a recent publication that came out. And while this publication was a, a publication that came out about older adults living in nursing homes, I think we can draw some um, conclusions from this um, that can be generalized or expanded to um, other people that may live in congregate type settings. So what we found were that um, uh, the rates of COVID-19 among residents and staff were higher in nursing homes, and also that in many cases there were higher rates of complications. So that's another place where we know that, um, you know, there's an increased risk for exposure. There's also possibly an increased risk for um, severe complications. So uh, going on further to thinking about group homes where individuals with disabilities may live, um, we know that there may be more people that live in those congregate settings, so that puts you at higher risk for exposure. We know that some residents may need um, or require closer contact with certain staff, such as direct service providers. Um, residents may have trouble understanding information about how to avoid um, exposure to COVID-19, or may, it may be unavoidable, unavoidable. It may just be very challenging to be able to sort of um, segregate in, in, a, in a group setting when somebody may um, have symptoms that are, are they're symptomatic of COVID-19. Um, so all of those things increase your risk for um, maybe getting COVID-19 and then possibly um, having some of those serious complications of COVID-19. Next slide. If you are a person who needs, um, uh, who may be at higher risk for COVID-19, it's important to just remember those things that I know that we've been hearing for, for almost a year or over a year, um, that uh, there are precautions that you can take. Um, staying at least six feet away from other people um, outside your home or in your home if uh, um, someone who's not usually in your home needs to come in um, to your home for some reason, if they're a visitor, if they're someone providing some health care or behavioral care, um, they should try to be social distance as much as possible. Um, if people are sick, um, they should um, uh, self-isolate and um, if uh, and people who who are at higher risk for COVID-19 infection should stay away from people who are sick if they know that they're sick. Wearing masks is very important, though I know it can pre present challenges for certain people, but as much as possible, wearing masks and even instituting sort of behavioral programs to teach people um, how to wear a mask um, and be able to become maybe a little more used to wearing a mask is very important, and then washing your hands often. Um, if uh, a person ha has had exposure to COVID-19 and starts feeling sick, they should contact their healthcare provider. Um, next slide. So those are all preventive things that need to keep happening. Those are things that we need to keep um, doing in order to sort of um, slow the, the pandemic. Um, but the other tool that we have now in our toolbox is vaccination. And so I'm going to talk a little bit now about vaccination and what we know and um, about the vaccine implementation. Next slide. So this is a place where you can go and get information every day on um, COVID-19 vaccination dis distribution and initiation, or we sometimes call that administration, but essentially that's getting a shot in, in your arm. So um, 
you can go to the COVID-19 vaccine tracker. This actually, this COVID-19 tracker gives you lots of information. It gives you information on how many people have COVID, where um, COVID is most prevalent in the country right now, things like that. But if you click on the vaccines part of that, you can see the number of uh, doses that have been distributed, the number that have been administered, and then some of the additional information like um, you can also see how many people in long-term care facilities have been vaccinated, and you can see that by um, state or jurisdiction. So you'll see here that um, over 44 million doses have been distributed so far, and about 23 million uh, vaccines have been administered. That means 23 million people, um, just over 23 million people have had um, a, a vaccination. Next slide. So why is uh, vaccination important? Um, vaccination is important uh, because it is a safer way to build protection. So we know that when a person gets the virus, so when they get COVID-19, they may get some nat natural protection or what we call immunity from um, that disease. But we don't know how long this lasts. We do have reports of people getting COVID-19 um, and then getting it again a couple months later or a few months later. So the risk of, um, you know, getting illness or, or dying from COVID-19 definitely outweighs the benefits of getting that natural immunity. So we're not encouraging people to go get exposed to COVID-19. So um, they get the disease and then they have it out of the way. What we do know is a better way to do that is um, to be va vaccinated. So to get the COVID-19 vaccine, because this will help protect you um, by building immunity without that risk of getting severe illness. Next slide. So right now there are two vaccines that have received what we call emergency use authorization or an EUA from uh, the Food and Drug Administration. And so that is um, kind of what, ha what happens is that the pharmaceutical companies provide all of the data that they have from their clinical trials. They give that to the FDA. The FDA does an independent review of that, and they determine whether they feel that the vaccine is safe and eff efficacious um, and should receive authorization. Because uh, so, so that has happened with um, the Pfizer Bio BioNTech uh, vaccine and also the Moderna vaccine. It's important to know that the Pfizer vaccine um, needs, you need two doses at least 21 days apart and the Moderna is two doses and uh, 28 days apart. So these vaccines were both uh, tested in tens of thousands of adults. Um, the, the, um, uh, that was, and the populations that these were tested on were representative of um, the American population. Uh, and the clinical trial data showed that both vaccines are safe and effective in preventing COVID-19. What we don't know is how long that protection from the vaccine might last because we're studying this again in, in real time. So there continues to be trials after this emergency use authorization happens. So they continue to gather more information um, post uh, release of the vaccine so that we will um, gain more information about things like how long um, the protection will last from this vaccine. Next slide. So these two vaccines, so there are um, a number of vaccines uh, in development um, that are sort of still making their way through the process. But these two vaccines, the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine, are um, called mRNA COVID-19 vaccines. And this is a, um, a, a new um, technology that has been used to create vaccines. However, it's not um, new in the sense that we haven't um, been looking at the development of these vaccines for a long time. So this um, development of mRNA vaccines has been going on for about a decade. Um, and uh, these uh, vaccines have been strongly tested. Um, like I said, the technology has been studied for more than 10 years. It's important to know that this mRNA vaccine does not contain any live virus. Sometimes vaccines do have 
um, a live virus and that's how they uh, promote the um, immunity that you get or the protection that you get from the vaccine. This one it does not contain, or these two do not contain live virus and do not have the chance of giving um, COVID-19 to the vaccinated person. The other important thing to understand is that mRNA from the vaccine never enters um, the center of the cell. So it doesn't change a person's DNA. It's really focused on making sure that a person does not um, get COVID-19 infection. Next slide. So once uh, EUA happens, once that emergency use authorization happens, um, a group that is an advisory group to the CDC called the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices provides um, recommendations on who that vaccine should be um, administered to and in what way. And so the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices meets regularly and in fact met today to discuss some things around COVID-19, uh, um, particularly around um, COVID-19 in children. One of the things they did very early on was talk about what their guiding principles would be in making those recommendations. So they had really two um, different guiding principles that were based on equity. They wanted to have efficient distribution. So they wanted to make sure that their recommendations would allow for efficient, expeditious, and equitable distribution and administration of the vaccine. And they recommended flexibility. So within the national guidelines that they um, put out, they recognized that states and local jurisdictions um, may did need to have flexibility in how those vaccines were administered based on what was going on in that in that local area. Next slide. So using that framework, they put together uh, recommendations that included um, different phases. So in phase 1A, um, right when um, the, the vaccine was allocated um, back in, in December, the recommendation was to vaccinate healthcare workers and long-term care facility residents and staff. Um, then the next uh, phase was frontline essential workers and persons aged 75 years and older, phase 1C, was those persons age 65 to 74 years of age, persons um, between the age of 16 and 64 with high risk medical conditions, and then essential workers that were not part of phase 1B. So the essential workers in phase 1B are people like uh, firefighters, uh, law enforcement, teachers, um, grocery workers, different people who sort of work on that front line every day. And then the other essential workers were in phase 1C. And then finally, phase two is um, people aged 16 years and older who are not in any one of those first three um, parts of, of phase one. These were, the, these were and are the recommendations, but what you'll see in that picture below is that there's overlapping of these phases. There's a recognition that there's no way that we're going to get through one phase and then move to the other. Part of that is because, um, you know, say you're in a state that is following these recommendations, there, it, you may get through your healthcare workers and long-term care facility residents much faster in maybe a rural area than you would in an urban area. So that people are gonna be moving through these phases in, in different times. And as I said on that last slide, there's also a recognition that there needs to be flexibility depending on the different jurisdictions. So um, I can give you a couple examples of different states that have done different things based on their um, needs of, of their jurisdiction. So for example, in Georgia where I live, what what the governor has um, recommended is that we're in something called phase 1A plus. And so phase 1A plus is healthcare workers, it's long-term care facility residents and staff, and it's also people over um, 65 years and older, and then certain essential workers, including law enforcement, EMT, and, and firefighters. Um, another example is in Texas. Um, they looked at their epidemiology and they um, made the decision that they would do healthcare workers and long-term care facility residents. And then their next phase was uh, uh, persons uh, 65 and older and persons 16 to 64 with high-risk medical conditions because they felt that that would be 
an approach that would um, be best for um, for Texans. And so I can give you those two examples to show that um, the ACIP does put those recommendations out there, but as you have maybe experienced, there is a lot of variability between what is happening in different places. Um, since um, the coming in of this new administration, there has been um, some discussions about um, more uh, vaccines that may be um, allocated to federal entities. So right now, um, or actually back in December, um, there was vaccine that was sent to some places like the Department of Defense, to the VA, the Veterans Administration, um, uh, and to Indian Health Services. Um, there's a possibility that vaccines will be administered to other kind of federal entities like that, possibly uh, federally qualified health centers, things like that, so that we can reach um, different groups of populations that may be harder to reach for vaccination. Next slide. So the, this is some information that you can find on the CDC website that just talks a bit about um, different either key facts or addresses certain uh, vaccine myths related to COVID-19. So um, it, it does provide um, the public information on getting how getting vaccinated can help prevent people from getting sick from COVID-19, um, why uh, people who have already had COVID-19 may still benefit from getting vaccinated. Um, it talks to those um, questions about um, COVID vaccine uh, not giving you uh, COVID-19, and then also um, talks a little bit about how the tests will uh, look if you get the COVID vaccine and then you get tested for COVID. So just very briefly, if you get the COVID-19 vaccine, it will not cause you to test positive on a viral test. What it could cause you to test positive on is an antibody test. And so it's important to know that if you had, if you had COVID-19 vaccine, you get symptoms and you think you may have COVID, you still can be tested with a viral test with one of those tests that they do, um, you know, sort of in, in the testing um, uh, lines. Uh, next slide. Okay, so a little bit about what you can expect if you get a COVID-19 vaccine. I think right now, um, you know, many people are in the category of not being in one of those first groups. But it's important to learn about COVID-19 vaccine and see where you fit into those recommendations. Um, you know, uh, definitely um, there are many um, grandparents, um, uh, um, you know, who are, are getting vaccinated right now. That's very important to make sure that people know where to get vaccines. When you get vaccinated, there are fact sheets that tell you the specifics about COVID-19 and you will also get a vaccine card that will give you the information of when you got it, which vaccine you got. Um, and that's something that people can hang on to um, so that they have a record of their vaccination. Um, and then finally, there are some things that might happen afterwards. Some people do experience some side effects from the COVID-19 uh, vaccine, some fatigue, some, um, uh, muscle aches, things like that. I'm going to tell you a little bit on the next slide about something called Be Safe. Um, and it's important to follow all those measures about wearing masks and social distancing. Next slide. So Be Safe is something to be aware of when you do get the COVID-19 vaccine. So it's something that you can voluntarily sign up for. It gives you, um, it's a text-based um, uh, monitoring system on smartphones. Uh, or web surveys, it asks you um, every day for the first week about the symptoms you're having, and then once a week for a number of weeks after that. That information all goes back to CDC, and it's called active monitoring. So it's helping us understand the types of uh, side effects that people may be having um, while after they receive the vaccine. So this is a new thing that we've been doing in addition to the, the regular um, adverse events uh, reporting that happens, which is called a passive monitoring system. This one is active because it's acting, asking people in real time. And hundreds of thousands of people have signed up to use this Be Safe. Next slide. So vaccination, again, is one measure to help stop the pandemic. Um, it is These vaccines appear very highly effective, but one more reminder, it's important to cover your nose and mouth with a mask 
Stay six feet apart from people who don't live with you. Avoid crowds and poorly ventilated indoor spaces and wash your hands. Next slide. And um, when, uh, you know, it is important to get vaccinated. So when vaccine is offered, um, I hope that you will um, choose to be vaccinated, participate in Be Safe, share that experience with your coworkers, your friends, your family, and understand the basics of COVID-19 vaccine. Help be one of those experts that can provide answers to questions about uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. And when you um, receive that vaccine, you know, wear the sticker if they give you a sticker or a button prominently, because this is something that we can all do together to um, really, you know, get us through or slow down this pandemic so we can get to a, a place where we can interact more freely one, with one another. Um, next slide. These next slides just provide some resources. So here's some resources on the COVID-19 uh, vaccine uh, CDC website. There's toolkits that you can use, things like that. Next slide. More resources. These ones are also on the CDC website, but specific to people with disabilities. And the final slide, I think. Yep. And that's a thank you. So I'll turn it back to you, Stuart. And uh, very glad to be here to share some information about COVID-19 vaccine. Thanks. So thank, thank you, Georgina, for a very informative presentation. I'm going to go now to uh, Dr. Arun Karper. Um, Arun has been doing uh, research for Autism Speaks on the impact of COVID on the autism community. Um, and he will be speaking about that research and about the information that we are uh, learning uh, uh, regarding the effects of COVID on our community. Arun? Thank you, Stuart. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining the uh, webinar today. Uh, I'll go through quickly in terms of what we are learning from our families of uh, children with autism spectrum disorders. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has posed substantial challenges in the lives of people with ASD and their families. As many of the studies by organizations represented on this call have indicated, the COVID-19 pandemic has taken a toll on the mental health and well-being of parents of children with ASD. Many families experience adverse economic consequences from job loss and their increased burden of uh, caring for their child with ASD. Um, Autism Speaks uh, conducted a comprehensive needs assessment of families uh, in COVID-19 pandemic using a nationwide survey in uh, November of 2020. And we observed a substantial uh, proportion of families reporting uh, food insecurity specifically one in eight non-Hispanic families, uh, uh, non-Hispanic white families indicated uh, food insecurity. That means uh, that they indicated that they were not able to purchase enough food since they did not have enough money. Uh, similarly, as you look at other uh, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, the food insecurity problem was much more severe. And the disparities indicate that uh, Hispanic families uh, were close to four times more likely and black non-Hispanic families were three times more likely to be food insecure than the non-Hispanic uh, white families. Um, one another finding that really uh, is of concern for us as we look at this is that families that receive SNAP or uh, what we call as food stamps were more likely to be food insecure during pandemic. Uh, and this is concerning because the SNAP or the food stamps program are designed to support uh, uh, families uh, through this uh, difficult phase. But during pandemic, especially during the periods of lockdown, many families could not find a way to secure needed food via online purchase. And uh, as a result, uh, they, there was a substantial disruption in their local systems of support during the lockdown as well, which, might, which has contributed to their experience of food insecurity. Now, going back when the pandemic uh, began, began in, in, in uh, late February, March last year, we did conduct a similar sort of survey uh, of, with our families. And when we look uh, uh, between that time and the November, which is like the six month period, we saw that the food insecurity increased dramatically among the overall population and the disparity between non-Hispanic white families and minority communities uh, just enhanced uh, by about 38 to 40 percent. Now, uh, along the same lines, what we are currently doing is we are working with uh, uh, something called fair health data, 
This is a, 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 a company that aggregates uh, uh, private medical claims data. Uh, and we are looking at studying the clinical impact of COVID-19 on adults with autism spectrum disorders. Uh, specifically, we are looking at understanding the impact of COVID-19 on hospitalization and overall costs of care. And, uh, and I think uh, our initial understanding is that the COVID-19 has substantially impacted uh, hospitalization in our community, as well as impacted the cost of care, uh, while the mortality is in some ways a, a little lower compared to those uh, individuals uh, who uh, commonly uh, have been identified as acquiring COVID-19 at a higher rate. So we are continuing to study this and will be able to report more specific findings on this analysis uh, in, in March of this year. Thank you, Dr. Carper. Um, I'm going to uh, now go to the panel and ask a series of questions. My first question is for Chris. Uh, Chris, in a December statement by a coalition of disability groups uh, pointed out a number of the disparate impacts that the pandemic has had on the autism community. Can you summarize for, uh, to our listeners why it's important to have widespread vaccination for people with autism and their caregivers? Chris, you're on mute, by the way. I was brilliant before there. <laughs> thank you all. Uh, I want to thank you and uh, Autism Speaks for putting this together and inviting so many of us from the autism community at large to be a part of this collaborative effort. You know, it, it's an extension of what we've been trying to do with the CDC over the life of the uh, pandemic as we have experienced it, our regular and frequent conversations with the CDC has allowed us to collaborate to, to recognize how important it is for the autism community as a whole to be thought of and encouraged to be vaccinated. And, and that's what prompted the Autism Society to reach out to our, our colleagues to present a statement, a unified statement about how important it was for the autism community to get vaccinated. We know that there, there's lots of issues and concerns with it, but we, what we really saw was very important was, it was an opportunity for the world and we really thought of it from that point of view to recognize that the autism community needs to be thought of when considering the vaccination and the vaccination protocol and the, and the algorithms that were being established. And we see that from what Dr. Peacock presented that the disability community was, in, was in, thought about for that algorithm and the phases of it. We know that it's also very important for the autism community vaccinated because of individuals living in group, group homes and congregate settings because, you know, Educational routines have been so disrupted. There's an opportunity to limit some of that. Um, I know that uh, we see independence ha has a, a key role for this and how do you help the transition to adulthood from this. We also know that the vaccine will provide programs uh, support for those with respite care and services. There's a variety of benefits for the individuals within the autism community for being vaccinated that go beyond the crucial component of this, which is to help stop the spread of this pandemic and to uh, allow us, as Dr. Peacock said so well, allow us to resume quote unquote normal activities uh, together. So uh, the Autism Society of America is delighted to put this, present, this, uh, pack, this presentation before uh, our colleagues and we received some wonderful support from the Autistic Self-Advocate Network, from uh, the Autism Science Foundation, Jefferson University Medical Center. Um, I'm also very happy that lots of uh, professionals from the autism community, uh, Kathy Pratt over at Indiana University, got a chance to see this and tell us what they thought about it and why it was so important. It was a real positive statement of collaboration. And Stuart, you know well that when, when it comes to legislation and things like that, we can really get together and work uh, in a collaborative way. And I think this was one more time where the autism community as a whole knew this was very important uh, for the Thank whole you, Chris. community. Thank you, Chris. This is, uh, this is important, uh, an important opportunity for the community to join together. Um, I'm going to turn to Allison now. Uh, Allison, in December, the Kaiser Family Foundation um, COVID-19 monitor found that 73% of Americans say they would get a COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, these are new vaccines, as we all know, so there may be some natural hesitancy going on there. 
Um, what advice do you have for someone who's nervous about getting the COVID vaccine? So you're absolutely right. There are a lot of people who are very eager to get this vaccine and the number of people who are saying they want to get the vaccine is going up, but there are still a number of people who are expressing hesitancy uh, about COVID-19 vaccines. I will tell you personally, I am happy when they talk about the reasons for their hesitancy, that autism is finally not on the list of reasons why people do not want to get the vaccine. To my knowledge, there is no one who has gotten the vaccine who has developed symptoms of autism. Now, um, that may change when we start to give the vaccine to children. And uh, as Dr. Peacock reported, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice at the CDC did meet today, and they did talk about the trials uh, in adolescents and children. And there are four vaccine manufacturers um, that are either beginning to study vaccines in adolescents or that will start the clinical trials in the next few months. So that's a, a very positive move forward. I think that um, the concern, the hesitancy that people are still expressing in many ways resulted from uh, the, the branding really, uh, calling it Operation Warp Speed led a lot of people to believe that the full testing that is usually required of vaccines would not be happening, that these vaccines would, get, would be rushed to market without proper testing um, and that people would be at risk. Uh, that's not in fact what happened. Uh, we were very vocal in advocating for full phase three trials of all of these vaccines to make sure that they were efficacious and safe. And in fact, the FDA panel did require the full phase three. Uh, what we didn't want to see happen was we didn't want there to be so much fear of this vaccine that it started to erode the progress that we made, helping people understand that other vaccines were safe and effective. So um, the reason that the, the time to market was so much quicker with this vaccine was not because safety testing was shortened, it was because uh, the manufacturers began to produce vaccine even before the FDA approved it. Now, had the FDA not approved those vaccines or they were shown to be unsafe, those manufacturers would have had to throw away all of that vaccine, but the government agreed to pay for that. So the risk was removed uh, from the manufacturers. That's typically not something we see. Normally a manufacturer is not producing vaccine until it's approved. So that's where the speed, the uh, collapse timeline came into place. There was no compromise on the gathering of safety data. Thanks, Allison. Allison, just um, um, fresh um, off the uh, my monitor, um, uh, Kaiser Fan, uh, Family Foundation today said uh, nearly half the public wants to get a COVID-19 vaccine as soon as they can, and this number has been going up. So that's a positive trend. Um, my next question is going to be for uh, Dr. Peacock. Um, so the question on the minds of many people is, uh, when will I or my son, my daughter, uh, get the vaccine? Um, how, can, how can we address that? I mean, people with disabilities were included in the vaccine trial. So, um, you know, when are people, uh, you know, when are people uh, who are, uh, on the autism spectrum, when are they going to be able to get the vaccine? I know there may be some variability, but I'm eager to get your response on that. Yeah, and, and so, um, you know, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a challenging question to answer. So there probably have been people with autism that have already been vaccinated um, because they may fit into one of those categories. They may be a healthcare worker of some kind. They may be um, uh, you know, someone who's over 65, um, they may be a frontline worker that has been vaccinated, or they may be in a state um, where uh, people with vaccines, uh, or sorry, with people with um, certain underlying medical conditions are um, being prioritized for vaccination. I know I did see in the chat, there was a question about whether someone with a seizure disorder would be uh, someone considered at high risk or in that underlying medical condition um, category and, and the answer is yes. Um, you know, having an underlying medical condition would put you um, in one of those priority groups. Um, 
you know, what has been challenging so far is that there's a limited supply of vaccine. And I think you've been seeing a lot about that in, in the news, what we did here. Um, and I, I don't have any kind of private information about this, but I did see on the, the news that the um, new administration is um, planning to purchase a lot more vaccine uh, in the coming months. And so um, that is a really positive sign that um, there's going to be more vaccine, vaccine available in states for people to be vaccinated. Well, well great. Well, um, glad to um, uh, hear that. Um, so, um, uh, Dr. Peacock, I know that uh, in addition to your role at CDC, that uh, you are active in clinics. Um, and um, that leads to the next question. Uh, how can um, uh, parents, caregivers, uh, speak uh, to uh, family members about the vaccine. How can, uh, what kinds of conversations uh, uh, should I, um, as the parent of an adult with autism, um, have uh, with my son? And so um, I think, you know, it's important for us all to be educated about the vaccine. Sessions like today give you some information about um, the COVID-19 vaccine, um, there are, um, uh, you know, but there, but there are also other, um, uh, it's important to think about making sure that the communication methods that we're using um, reach the people we're trying to communicate with. So um, we have been doing some work at CDC with um, the Georgia Tech uh, Center for Innovation they are taking um, sort of the COVID-19 messages, both the prevention messages and the vaccination messages and adapting those um, for accommodations for uh, different disabilities. So in some cases um, you may need information that is um, you know, um, written for a person with intellectual disability that may have a lower literacy level. Um, and so uh, some of those resources are available on the CDC website. Um, and certainly we can also send um, you links to some of these other partners that we've been working with. Um, you know, the key I think is um, one thing that family members should do is if um, they are eligible for a vaccine, they should be vaccinated because that means that there's more protection in that household um, for a person that may be at higher risk for um, complications and talk about it. Talk about the reasons for getting that vaccine um, uh, because we're trying to collectively get to a place where we can interact with others, you know, in, in the ways that we used to. Um, I think, uh, um, yeah, I, I think that the, those are, those are the, some of the things that come to mind um, when I'm thinking about that. The, the one, I guess the other thing that I, that I have heard is that um, there have been concerns that sometimes um, children uh, don't want to be vaccinated. You know, the actual act of being vaccinated is, is stressful to them. And I think talking with um, your healthcare provider ahead of time, maybe even visiting the place where that vaccination may occur, do some of those things like we do typically with um, children with autism, maybe those social stories, things like that, because the last thing that we want is people to be restrained, for example, to, for, by get, and getting a vaccine, which I, I've heard some accounts of that, and that is certainly something I hope that your organizations can, we can work with you all to give those um, messages about how that isn't something that needs to happen. There are other ways to um, work with an individual with autism um, to get a vaccination other than things like restraint and things like that. Thank you. Um, I have another question for you, uh, Dr. Peacock. Um, uh, so uh, Allison talked about the ACIP and the progress uh, of uh, vaccines, uh, research uh, on vaccines for children. Can you tell us where we now stand? I understand that the uh, Moderna and Pfizer vaccines have different um, starting ages, uh, if you will. Uh, um, you know, can you tell us um, how um, about the progress we're making uh, towards um, uh, a, approval for a vaccine for uh, for people younger than age sixteen? Sure. 
So I actually um, did do a call a friend. And so I texted a friend of mine at CDC to, to get a little bit more information. Um, so uh, the you are right. So Pfizer and Moderna are different. So Pfizer is down is approved down to age 16. Moderna is 18. That's because um, Pfizer had enough information in their vaccine clinical trials that they had that the FDA and then the ACIP um, were comfortable with making that recommendation down to 16. The next increment is down to 12. And so there are clinical trials going on right now that are looking at, you know, whether it's 12 to, um, uh, you know, 15 in, in the, the Pfizer or 12 to um, 17 in Moderna. So there's clinical trials happening right now. And when there's sufficient data, that data will go to the, uh, be presented to the FDA and then subsequently to the ACIP. And, um, you know, there will be approval for those vaccines. It, it, does, it takes time um, to gather that information and they want to do it in a safe way to make sure that we have the, the most safe and efficacious vaccine for children. Um, and there are extra precautions that are taken when um, vaccines are, or any clinical trials happen in children. So the next increment will be that 12 to whether it's, you know, uh, 16, 17, 18 years of age. And then there will ultimately be testing in, in children that are younger than that, clinical trials in children younger than that, but that next group will be those adolescents. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I've got a question for um, uh, Dr. Carper. Um, until everyone is vaccinated, the autism community, particularly minority communities, um, are experiencing profound hardship. hardship. What help is out there? Well, uh, as I had uh, indicated early on, uh, our ex communities uh, are experiencing unprecedented uh, levels of food insecurity. Um, and uh, my encouragement uh, for all our families is to be able to reach out to their local uh, food banks uh, as well as uh, reach out to their uh, schools and community-based organizations. Uh, I know last year, uh, through the congressional action, there was an expansion of benefits that was available to support and uh, address food insecurity. Uh, and similarly, the recent uh, executive order signed by the President Biden uh, has also enhanced uh, that opportunity. Uh, at the same time, we recognize that all uh, families live in different circumstances in different uh, parts of our country. I think uh, uh, one additional uh, way that families can find help is to call uh, the autism response team for guidance and resources. Uh, so the way you would reach it uh, is uh, the, the phone number of the autism response team is 1-888-AUTISM-2. Uh, and they also have a dedicated Spanish line. Uh, and the number for the Spanish line is 1-888-772-9050. Uh, and uh, families could uh, otherwise be able to email us at help at autismspeaks.org. Uh, I think through multiple resources, families uh, can find help uh, until the time uh, the vaccines reach our communities and that Overall, uh, we are safe uh, and hopefully are able to be back at work and see the economic recovery that we hope to see uh, in the future. Thank you, Arun. Um, my last question is for uh, Dr. Peacock. Uh, Dr. Peacock, you talked about the ramp up in production and, um, and um, goals to increase uh, the number of vaccinations produced. Um, uh, if you could expand on that a little. And, and one of the uh, topics um, um, of the moment, of course, is reports about variants um, and um, how that could affect um, uh, vaccines. Um, if you could talk about the ramp up and how uh, the process uh, is adjusting uh, as we see variants uh, appearing on the horizon. Mm -hmm. So uh, there, there clearly um, have been um, reports that say that, that more vaccine is coming into production and um, that kind of was anticipated and I think is being accelerated. So 
the the way most vaccine is being distributed right now is it's being distributed to states. There are some other ways it's being distributed, like I mentioned before, the Indian Health Service. Um, there are allocations that are going to the Veterans Administration and to um, uh, the um, Department of Defense. Uh, there are also programs where vaccine is being um, either, uh, not to get too complicated, but, but is the, the federal government is partnering with pharmacies. And so pharmacies um, may be the, the entity that are providing the vaccines. And so, so some of those allocations from states will go to, to pharmacies. Um, and then finally, there are other ideas like um, uh, vaccines being distributed in federal health, qualified health centers. So the, the objective is not only that, um, yes, vaccine definitely needs to increase in production. And as soon as we um, have that vaccine, the, you know, the federal government has bought the vaccine and that vaccine is allocated. The, the next um, really kind of complicated issue is how do you get that vaccine to places where people can get vaccinated? Some places in the country have had more challenges with that than others. And that's why these different programs are being developed so that people have more places that they can uh, be vaccinated. So um, hopefully what we will be seeing in the next weeks to months is that um, these vaccines are getting to um, more hard to reach populations. And so, um, you know, anyway, and then so switching over to talking about variants. So yes, we are seeing mutations in the, the COVID-19 uh, virus. Those um, variants um, we expect, so we expect that viruses mutate. Right now, the mutations that um, are circulating, particularly you say the one in the, the UK and the United Kingdom, the one that came from South Africa, those appear to um, uh, be per, the COVID vaccine that is available right now appear to be protective against those. Um, we are continuing to, our researchers at CDC and other uh, places um, are continuing to monitor that and will pay very close attention to making sure that they know um, whether the immunity is changing um, from the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, but right now it looks like they are protective that's one reason also that we need to make sure that all of those doses of vaccine that are available are getting into people's arms because the more we can stop the spread of COVID-19, the less likely it is to have these mutations. And so, um, you know, getting vaccinated, wearing masks, washing hands, and all of those protective measures, slowing down the spread of COVID-19 is another way to prevent um, these mutations in the virus. Well, thank you um, so much, uh, Dr. Peacock. Um, I'm going to um, move towards uh, wrapping up. Um, and um, um, I want to emphasize that every state is handling rollout and definitions differently, and that local contacts are a best resource. Uh, the CDC website has an easy to use map um, that will uh, uh, point to those resources. Um, as a reminder, we will be emailing the resources you've seen today uh, to, um, to everyone. Um, so uh, you will be getting um, more information. Um, uh, we will be saving the entire Q&A box uh, for us to draft a FAQ from. Um, and so you'll, uh, you'll be seeing this uh, information. Um, for more information about COVID in the autism community, as well as tools to help you and your family in a number of languages, please visit autismspeaks.org slash coronavirus. Um, I wanna uh, turn to uh, some of our panelists. Um, uh, uh, Chris, um, I'm gonna uh, ask you uh, to uh, refer to uh, Autism Society's uh, uh, COVID resources and or upcoming events. Chris, you're on mute again. I think after 11 months, I'd have that mastered. Uh, thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, the Autism Society's uh, toolbox is up there. We were very excited to be the, one of the first to put out a, uh, a toolkit for the autism community, actually the first one to do that. And, and we've collaborated with a lot of people for that. So you have plenty of information on the autism-society.org. 
And in, in addition to Dr. Kapar's reference to where to get resources, I'd like to add, you know, uh, reach out if you need to, to the autism affiliates in your community, because uh, Stuart, you're right, it is a local thing, right? And the opportunity to get services in the community that you live. Feel free to reach out to the Autism Society and uh, we can direct you to that at 1-800-3-AUTISM, 1-800-3-AUTISM, and we can help you uh, find services in your local community. But as Dr. Peacock said, the most important thing is that we get as many people as possible to get vaccinated as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Allison, I'm gonna ask you uh, the same question about resources. Uh, well, we also have on our website, a list of resources. We have information uh, not only for families raising children with autism, but also for scientists who are conducting autism research to help them uh, to pivot their research uh, towards virtual um, data collection. Um, and we have, we have a, a COVID grant program where not only are we studying the unique effects of COVID-19 on individuals with autism, but we also have grants for scientists who need anything from uh, personal protective equipment to give to families who are coming into the clinic uh, or additional resources so that they can pivot to, to telehealth, provide um, tablets for families participating in research so that they can continue to do that at home. And just on that, you know, I know COVID-19 has been an absolutely horrible experience for most of our family, all of our families really. And, but the one positive thing that has actually come out of this is we have learned a tremendous amount about how we can do diagnosis uh, virtually, which in many cases allows clinicians to see the children in their home environment, which had never been the case. You know, so often we would hear, when I brought him to the clinic, he didn't behave the way he usually behaved. Now the diagnosticians are able to see the kids in their home environment. We're also learning a lot about best practices for tele-delivered therapy. And that will open up the opportunity for access to therapy to thousands of people who live in under-resourced areas who were not able um, to get uh, speech therapy, occupational therapy, applied behavior therapy in the clinic environment or to have people come to their homes because of where they lived or lack of resources. We're now learning about the best ways to deliver that therapy virtually and that will also um, help so many people even when this pandemic is over. Thank you, Allison. Um, um, uh, on my screen, I, I'm seeing a slide for resources and I would uh, direct the um, audience uh, to uh, uh, to the resources um, uh, up on the slide. Um, after the webinar, uh, you, um, uh, the audience is going to be uh, redirected to a survey uh, to give us um, uh, the audience's thoughts about today's events and how we can uh, make things better. Um, so um, uh, as a uh, final note, um, uh, if anyone is interested in helping us advocate for policies that benefit people for, uh, with autism and their families, please visit autismspeaks.org slash advocacy to join our grassroots advocacy network and learn more. Uh, you can also follow our social media accounts uh, for all the information from today's conversation and more updates from Autism Speaks, the CDC, Autism Society and Autism Science Foundation. Um, I want to um, uh, thank everyone uh, for, um, for uh, their work on this. Um, uh, I uh, I'm going to describe this as a labor of love. Uh, it wasn't really much of a labor because this is something that um, you know we're, uh, we as a community uh, have come together and we are working uh, to protect the people we care about. So um, thank, thanks everyone on the panel and uh, thanks. Uh, to uh, the audience for tuning in and um, uh, let's all speak again soon.